My name is Birgit Schneider. I'm living in Berlin, Germany. I'm a cultural and media scholar and my special interest is climate images and imaginaries of climate change in science and culture and I'm researching at Potsdam University. The reason for the following interview is the pressing question of what we can do better or maybe completely differently in climate change communication. And to discuss this question, we invited several speakers. And it was important to us to juxtapose voices from different fields of studies and to combine perspectives also from different countries. And my guest for this interview is Ines Ponce de Leon. Dr. Ines Ponce de Leon, she is an associate professor at the Department of Communication at the Ateneo de Manila University in the Philippines. And before she received a PhD in science communication, she graduated, and this is interesting, in molecular biology and biotechnology. And her primary interest is the um, science communication and climate change communication. And um, I would like to welcome you now, Ines, and I'm looking forward to our talk. Thank you so much for having me. And good afternoon from the Philippines. <laughs> good morning from Berlin. <laughs> um, I would like to start with an opening scene for us. So, um, as we all know, um, scientific knowledge and information are key when making decisions. And this is also true for climate change policy. So, we have this idea, and this is very common, that if the knowledge is presented in an interesting and understandable way, there can be a direct path to different groups of people to inform their decision taking on political levels, on different personal levels also. Why did you get uneasy with this model? And why are facts not everything? Okay, uh, thank you for asking that question. It actually brings me back to the original reason that I pursued science communication in the first place. You were right from the profile. I am a graduate of molecular biology, but I ended most of my career as a bench or a laboratory scientist by talking to people from all over the Philippines. So my group and I, I was part of a group of researchers, of faculty members that talked about genetically modified organisms in different places. We spoke with teachers, we spoke with farmers, we spoke with students in different audiences and even fellow scientists. We labored under the assumption that we simply needed to put in good information, the central dogma of molecular biology, DNA, uh, beautiful pictures of DNA. To this day, I love those photos. I love looking at DNA. And we thought that simply giving the facts would convince people to adopt genetically modified crops. This was around the year 2000 when Bt corn was still introduced to the world. And the Philippines was one of the places where Bt corn was tested. We thought that simply giving people facts about how much yield they would get, how safe their crops would be, how good their harvest would be, we thought that would be enough. But we got shouted at by farmers. NGOs or non-government organizations would tell us that we were out of touch with reality. We were told that we were wrong because we weren't listening to people on the ground. To this day, I can hear those voices, but I don't hear them as much with as much as with with resentment as much as I do now with understanding. Back then, I just thought this is reality. This is science. Science is showing reality and facts. Why can't you see the facts and the reality I present? It's really beautiful. Look at the beautiful slides I made. I went into my PhD thinking that that was what communication was about primarily because that was how I was educated in science. Sit down, listen to the facts, 
look at your beautiful textbook. You learn a lot. But as I studied communication, and as I did field work, especially now in climate change communication, in science communication research, in risk communication, I found that people don't make decisions based on facts alone. They could, but in the heat of the moment, when the flood waters are rising 30 meters in an hour, when flood waters bring with them debris, trash, danger, when people have to evacuate because an earthquake has suddenly struck, or even now in COVID, we see that Facts don't necessarily take a back seat, but people's decision-making is far more complex than simply calculating, looking at scientific findings, weighing research, and looking at which research has which implications and weighing which research is more credible than the other. There's nothing wrong with using scientific facts. But in my studies and my research, and especially in my field work, I found that facts are part of a greater tapestry of how people make decisions. They're not the only thing we use to make decisions. So they shouldn't be the only thing we consider when creating policies, when creating programs, and when planning for people, for different audiences and for different groups who might have different perceptions about different hazards. Can you tell us more about your research? Maybe at this very moment, your country is again experiencing heavy storms, but you, after the storm Haiyan in 2013, um, which produced 17 meter high waves, uh, you went to several communities in your country. And uh, what did you find out and why were the warnings? which had been communicated one week before the storm, I think. Why were not they not uh, taken serious, more seriously? We thought that people had heard the warnings and we thought that everyone would pretty much have the same answer. They understood the warnings or they didn't understand the warnings. Could you please make them simpler? We were surprised. I was surprised. I thought that all the communities would be the same. But it turns out that they were very different. Well, let me tell you more about that. In every community that we visited, we went to, to what we like to call a village. It's, it, it's called in Filipino a barangay. We went to a coastal barangay or a coastal village, so they'd be the most at risk for storm surges. And we also went to a poblacion which is an inner city closer to aid, closer to information, closer to help. It's near City Hall. We did that for five different locations. We did it for the first landfall of Haiyan, a city that was nearly wiped from the map by storm surges, a multi-awarded island which the UN has recognized for its resilience, a tourist destination which divers will tell you is one of the best diving destinations in the world, but which never experienced storms prior to Haiyan. And finally, a city, a city on an island, quite urbanized, not sustaining as great damage, but already building back better. So we took a look at all these five and we found very different communities, even within the same city. A coastal village and a poblacion village would be so different from each other. They'd be mere hours away from each other, but they would understand warnings or see warnings or look at knowledge differently. We found several things. On the eastern seaboard of the Philippines, we have cities that are always, always struck by storms. They call themselves resilient not because they know how to protect themselves, but because anytime a storm comes their way, they just meet it and say, hello again, let me meet you. It was tragic to listen to it because they had lost thousands of lives. Most of them didn't even get to see the bodies of their dead relatives and friends. 
but they were just willing to meet storm after storm. And this came out in our focus group discussions and in our field work. They spoke of the Virgin Mary protecting them, of God being there for them, God protecting their city. So they didn't need to worry about floods. The Philippines is a Catholic country, or for that matter, a Christian country. But to hear it like this from the focus group discussions was very difficult for me because I knew that they were speaking even if they had endured so much tragedy. This was three years after Haiyan, and you could feel that pain, and yet you could still hear that faith. When we kept coming closer to the middle of the Philippines, it changed. In the east side, you would hear them say, yeah, I heard about the warnings, but I'd be protected. Or, I heard about the warnings, but we've always endured storms. How could this be much worse? In the middle, you had people saying, we've never had storms, so we can't imagine what it's like to be hit with 250 kilometers per hour. We don't know what that feels like, but we felt it, so now we know what it feels like. Thanks. In not so many words and with not as much, you know, flippancy. But that's almost the tone that it took. Thanks to the storm, now I know what it feels like. I'll, I'll do better in the next one. We moved into the west side, farther out into the China Sea, South China Sea, into the tourist area. You had people who never experienced a storm before. And then they were suddenly told, you are going to experience a very strong storm. Take a look at 230 kilometer per hour winds. They said, we've never experienced a strong storm, but we've experienced strong storms. Maybe this is what it feels like. The strong storms they experienced never went upwards of 120 kilometers per hour. They were surprised by what 230 kilometers per hour felt like. They didn't know that it was that strong. They couldn't make sense of mere numbers or even being told that the storm will upend your houses, upend your, your tricycles and your bicycles and your cars. It, it didn't make sense. We heard so many different things. In fact, right after that storm, and this goes back to your question and facts, the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council, which heads rehabilitation post-disaster in the Philippines, said that they would, and they recommended that the term storm surges should be translated into local languages so that people could understand what a storm surge is. So they recommended a Filipino term, daluyong. Daluyong is wave in a very, a very literal sense. It's wave. And you can even hear it in the tenor of the speech. Daluyong. It sounds like a song. One of the other communities said, don't call it storm surge. Don't call it daluyong. If you had called it a tsunami, we would have remembered because we see what tsunamis can do on TV. So they said, call it a tsunami, which is against the science, but that's what they remembered. That's what they saw on television. Move over to the West. And they all told us in these communities, please don't call it storm surge. Just tell us it's a storm surge, just leave. You don't have to tell us what it's about. You don't have to tell us about the science, just say, leave. And one of the people actually said, it's okay, call it a storm surge. Don't call it Naluyong. I don't know what that is. That makes me want to sleep when I hear it. I know what the storm surge is. I've always known what the storm surge is. My country is 7,107 plus 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 islands with 150 living languages. I've tackled only 10 communities, and those 10 communities have so many different understandings of this same phenomenon. So this interpersonal, close-knit communication works with our communities. So um, as, if I understand you correctly, you're uh, propagating that the top-down um, information 
way only is not enough, but you need a long term uh, bottom up and on all levels communication dialogue um, on a local level uh, to enhance this situation and the trust. You were also um, asking for more trust on this level. And there, of course, we have to talk now about uh, your research you've done some years ago. And I think this also connects to this very important question. You looked into climate services um, and climate change communication literature, and you came up with the observation of how different paradigms are grounding climate change communication. And I think this top-down paradigm might be one of the ones, one of these paradigms you were, um, you came up with. Um, so maybe you could tell us in the first pl place, what do you understand as a paradigm in your research? A paradigm is a way to look at reality. It has certain assumptions about the way reality is structured. Uh, it has certain assumptions about what constitutes valid knowledge and how we can get to that valid knowledge. It has assumptions about how the world works. To reiterate what you mentioned, the top-down paradigm is post-positivist in nature. It comes from philosophy. This a lot of what I what I'm talking about comes from the field of philosophy and uh, it comes from the field of logic. So whenever I teach my students about paradigms, I always tell them it's a logic game. You have to learn how to play by the games of logic and you don't break the logic. You have to carry it to its conclusion. So for top down or for, or for post positivism, for such a paradigm, the world is seen as full of observable objective, knowable patterns. Everything is patterned, and it's our job as researchers to elucidate, to look for the patterns, to report them, and to use objective data in reporting them, which is why scientific information is largely quantitative. It's that objectivity at work. Nothing is ever final. We always build on existing information if we want to be strict about it, we don't necessarily build an existing information. We confirm or disconfirm existing information. If we want to go by the rules of Thomas Kuhn in Scientific Revolutions, he says that a scientific revolution happens when normal science ceases to be. And normal science is just us confirming and confirming the same thing, seeing the truth happening over and over. But when we see something outside the truth, something outside that data, a revolution happens, a discovery happens, it changes the way we do science and changes the way we see um, the world. It doesn't necessarily change the way we see reality, but it might change the way we do things. We see this often in physics. We have planetary physics, but when you get outside of the Earth's atmosphere, you'll need Einsteinian mechanics in order to understand the world out there. So that's a paradigm shift. It doesn't mean that old knowledge is wrong. It's just that old knowledge was incomplete. And that plays right into top-down work. Because in post-positivism, you recognize that the scientist is the expert. And he who holds the facts, she who holds the facts, holds the knowledge, holds the power. And when you have that kind of power, that power then becomes the source of information in science communication. So the information in top-down post-positivist work always comes from a scientific expert that's top-down. The audience is then, to some extent, assumed to be ignorant, not intelligent enough, or speaking a whole other language, but because the facts are considered objective, then all we need to do is translate them, which then leads to that whole paradigm of top-down, just translate it, put it in a brochure, make it beautiful, and people will understand and take action. It all comes from that logic of post-positivism. People don't get the chance to give feedback because they're not in a position to do so. They're assumed to not know anything and are incomplete without scientific knowledge. You found two other paradigms which you see underestimated in climate change communication. A research group in my university worked with a barangay, another village, that was always 
inundated by floods. Instead of creating a focus group and then showing them information on a blackboard or giving them a lecture, they asked the barangay officials to recreate a map of the community. And they didn't make them draw it. They made them build it. So they made them, they gave them cardboard and marbles and sand and paper. And they made them build the community right down to the topography. Then they asked the officials, tell us, where are your problem spots? Or where is the problem here? And the officials could articulate really, really well, not just based on their knowledge, but with the help of the map. They said, this is where flooding is. Oh, look, no wonder it gets flooded over here because this drainage is positioned this way and gravity, blah, 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 leads to this. The map helped them. But the researchers just, just sat back and watched. And that community eventually came up with the idea of, okay, let's work with people who know how to relay the pipes Let's work with our community so that we can have gardens where there are lots of water. They help each other out. And the researchers then simply had to facilitate. And that's critical thought. It is breaking out of one's assumptions about one's world, which is what the researchers did for the community. Critically think about your location and formulate, formulate your own solution. It happens for communities that work well together, not always with communities that have some inner strife or that have a low level of trust in their officials. Another estimated paradigm is the constructivist one. It's meaning making. It rests heavily on the assumption that we can never know the world completely. This is a wild divergent paradigm from post-positivism. But constructivism is radical. We'll never know the world. We're not even sure if there's a reality. But we can be sure of how we talk about it. That's why constructivist thought relies on conversation. I've seen this in research of uh, the Marshall Islands, I believe, in a study of the language if it wasn't the Marshall Islands, it would have been some South Pacific area where the word climate is the same as the word for universe. So to tell them that climate change is happening is to tell them the universe is changing. If you tell people that the universe is changing, there is so little they can do but sit back, which is exactly what the community did, sit back. But it took a study of their language, a very specific study, in order to generate that knowledge. So you are calling for a balance for balancing the paradigms, and I think this is also the idea to use uh, methods like co-creation and dialogue uh, as a systematic method to enhance the climate change communication. And um, on the other hand, I'm asking myself, like, how could you enhance this balancing of paradigms? So for natural scientists, it would be wonderful if they could get a, a glimpse into these paradigms and be open to them, be open to working within them, especially with a critical paradigm where power is handed to people. The power of knowledge is no longer in the hands of scientists, but in the hands of those that experience the hazard or will experience it. So when that power is taken away, I can understand that scientists would feel disenfranchised or disempowered or told that they don't matter. They do, but they're also told, and they're, it's hope that they know that they might need to do some power sharing or they might need to listen to other sources of knowledge in order for their own knowledge to grow, to be enriched. We see this a lot when scientists go out into the field, climate change scientists go out into the field and do research on islands, on uh, mountaintops, at the bottom of the sea, work with communities. I've always gotten to talk with scientists post field work, and they always say the same thing. It is so different outside the laboratory. I learned so much work in the field, but I also learned so much insight in the field. At the end of your impulse paper, you are posing some questions, very severe questions yourself. 
And I'm, I know that we cannot answer them right here. Um, but these last questions you, you asked, like, what kind of worlds do we sh show to those whose worlds are governed by experience and the here and now? And um, for me, this is a very interesting question because the, this idea of a here and now perspective, which is very spherical, so I'm uh, embedded into my environment and this is my situation and how can I cope with this? Um, and maybe it, this uh, idea contradicts also this top-down level, which is uh, global and detached. Um, is there an idea you received from from your perspective from your here and now in the philippines and you would like to add to this wow um i will speak as somebody who has seen the devastation brought by yet another typhoon make that a pair of typhoons when i wrote that impulse paper i kept on asking and i i, I like how you brought up that question because that is the question i asked only coming off of research because we've always we always heard this from our participants that I'm not planning for the next few days or even the next or even tomorrow. I'm planning for today. What will I eat today? What will I where will I sleep today? Can I even afford to sleep today or should I work today? And this is a reality that um it was abstract to me, but it became all the more real in the here and now of the Philippines. As I saw media coverage, as I read the accounts of people who had to ask for help online because it was the only place left when the electricity went out. There was a rather insensitive question asked by one of our media outlets a few days ago when the devastation became very apparent. They asked some of the people in these far-flung towns and in these villages, if you've always been flooded, why haven't you left yet? Why didn't you evacuate early? It's a sensible question to ask if you are not someone affected by the flood and if you are not someone who has to dig their house out of 15 feet of mud or someone who isn't living from one day to the next. But for a greater part of the population of this country, and this has become more apparent in a mixture of a pandemic and a storm, a greater part of the population of my country, and perhaps of this world as well, has to contend with living with these hazards because they live in areas that don't allow them to move quickly that don't give them the chance to evacuate whenever they want. There's little planning going on. Not because people are dumb, not because people don't know any better, but because their reality tells them that today, the here and now is what is real. Let's see what tomorrow brings. So, they can't plan when to leave. They can't plan when to evacuate. When we were told that the Philippines' major cities would disappear by 2050, people just looked at it and went, where else are we going to go? We don't have that kind of money to leave, to pack up. We can just adapt. We can't mitigate. There's so little change we can make. I've seen that the facts don't always matter. And I think that climate change communication can be enriched by looking at these very unique and very small community experiences because they speak so well of the cultures in which these people live, but in the here and now that make up their reality. And they tell us of the so many realities this world has. Thank you so much, Ines. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your ideas and sharing your insights um, in this situation. And uh, thank you so much.
Thank you so, so much. You have been wonderful. It's, this is great. This is such a great opportunity, and I am so honored to be a part of this.